This is the second part of a video series on technical tips and tricks for ultrasound guided peripheral nerve blocks. In the previous video, we discussed positioning and ergonomics and the scanning and planning phase of the procedure. Here, we will talk about needle insertion and guiding the needle to the nerve target to deposit local anesthetic effectively and safely. We'll start with the in-plane approach. Before inserting the needle, confirm one last time that the nerve target is where you want it on the ultrasound screen. In the middle of the screen, in the far one-third, or less commonly in the near one-third. The optimal location to position the nerve depends on three things that is up to us to decide. First, the angle of the needle trajectory that we want to use, steep or shallow. Needles are usually more echogenic at shallow angles, but it can be difficult to pierce fascial layers. It also influences the second factor, the distance that the needle has to travel to the target. And this in turn determines the length of the needle track through the tissues. A long needle track reduces the maneuverability of the needle tip as the shaft gets trapped in the tissues, so it should be avoided if possible. Finally, where you will pierce the skin relative to the probe edge, close to it or a little distance away. Now most times, we think we'll be coming in at the corner of the ultrasound image, which corresponds to the very edge of the probe. But in reality, most of the time, it feels most natural to enter about half a centimeter away. But this makes a significant difference to the trajectory and should be accounted for when planning. Now again, if you don't get it right the first time and find yourself struggling, don't hesitate to change your skin insertion site if you have to. You should never feel like you're fighting your needle when trying to maneuver the tip or that you are bending it. Never use force to manipulate the needle. Instead, withdraw and reinsert to make a new track as needed. Always keep the bevel facing up towards the probe as the tip will then cast a characteristic double echo that identifies it. This will allow you to recognize if you're looking at part of the shaft rather than the tip, as can happen if your needle is tangential to the ultrasound beam, and you can make the necessary correction to alignment. It helps to remember that you're trying to align two very small structures. Think of the ultrasound beam as the thickness of your credit card and imagine trying to line that up with your needle. All movements, especially of the probe, should therefore be micro movements, small and controlled. The ability to do this starts as mentioned with good attention to ergonomics and a stable hand position. Also, I recommend avoiding applying too much gel, which makes everything slippery. And my advice is to start with the same amount of gel as you would put toothpaste on your toothbrush. Sliding micro movements of the probe and beam across the needle shaft are the primary movement for trying to get alignment. Do this, however, while maintaining the probe tilt that gives you the best visibility of the nerve. Do not use probe tilting to find the needle unless you have no choice. This is because fine control is difficult and tilting may also reduce echogenicity of the nerve. There is no point in seeing your needle well if you can't see the nerve well and vice versa. You need to see both and you may have to combine both tilting and sliding micro movements throughout needle advancement. This is illustrated well in this video that I showed earlier. Don't expect to be able to continuously maintain alignment and keep your needle in view. Accept instead that the needle will wink in and out of view. Experts like this person here make continuous micro movement with both their hands, tilting and sliding the probe, moving the needle tip around, but all in a coordinated fashion. Tracking the needle tip as it advances is thus a dynamic fluid series of movements and once again, is greatly helped by learning to have a relaxed grip on both probe and needle. There are two primary needle movements for helping to find your needle as you slide the probe back and forth. The first is jiggling, moving the needle in small staccato in and out movements. These are safe in that you will not penetrate vessel walls or nerve sheaths with a blunt block needle, but you will generate enough tissue movement to show you where your needle is. The second needle movement that I find very helpful is seesawing the hub up and down. This will generate a lifting and falling tissue motion at the needle tip, which should correspond to the arc that you are making at the needle hub. 
It is also invaluable to pay attention to the tactile feedback of pops or loss of resistance as your needle tip advances through each fascial layer. This corresponds to a visible stretching or tenting of the fascia and a recoil as it is pierced. Once again, having a relaxed yet controlled grip on the needle hub will enhance your ability to sense this. Finally, needle tip position can be confirmed by hydrolocation, which is the injection of a small amount of fluid. Half a milliliter or less is all that you need, and the injection should be rapid rather than slow and careful. A trickle of fluid does not produce the same tissue movement that a small jet of fluid does and will be hard to see. You must be explicit in your instructions to your assistant about these details to avoid wastage of local anesthetic and inefficient hydrolocation efforts. In this other video, you can see that the fluid spread occurring from a small amount like half a mil is visible even though we don't actually have needle beam alignment. A further tip is to keep the probe and ultrasound image absolutely stable during the hydrolocation injection, which will help to detect the subtle tissue motion that's produced by the small bolus of fluid. If we use an out-of-plane rather than in-plane approach, there are different considerations regarding needle and probe handling to be aware of. It's important to conceptualize what is happening when we use an out-of-plane needle advancement. The needle tip will not stay within the beam as it is advanced, and the probe has to be continuously moved away from the needling hand to track the tip. It's tempting to use tilting probe motions to track the tip, but do not do this for nerve blocks, as again, tilting will change the visibility of the nerve target. Slide the probe instead. It is also helpful in the scanning phase to have identified a section of nerve length that can be easily visualized. The needle tip and shaft can look very similar in the out-of-plane approach, and the best way to distinguish them is to look for the acoustic shadow that the shaft will cast, and watch for this to disappear as you slide towards the tip. As with the in-plane approach, it's important in the planning phase to make decisions about the angle of your needle trajectory, which will influence where you puncture the skin relative to the probe. At a shallower needle trajectory, a larger portion of the shaft may potentially be imaged and thus mistaken for the tip. A steeper needle angle inserted close to the probe is thus often best for single injection blocks as it minimizes the distance that you will have to slide your probe as you track the tip to the target. However, if inserting a catheter, a steep angle increases the chance that the catheter will advance away from the nerve rather than along it. And for catheters, therefore, I aim to keep the introducer needle angle less than 45 degrees, preferably more like 30 degrees, to ensure that the catheter travels parallel to the nerve. The chosen needle angle and where you intend to land on the nerve will influence where you puncture the skin, how far away or how close to the probe. Note, however, that for very shallow nerves, a steep approach is sometimes not advisable as the tip will not intersect the beam before it reaches the target and you will not be able to see the tip. In this case, a shallower trajectory closer to 45 degrees is preferable, recognizing that you may have to do a little bit of sliding to track the needle tip. As with the in-plane approach, looking for tissue motion with needle movement is very helpful. The two important movements are side-to-side -side waggling and in-and-out jiggling. While making these movements, slide the probe slowly to and fro in very small increments. It's also important to use tactile feedback as additional cues, sensing the pop or loss of resistance that comes with piercing each fascial layer, and match that to the tenting and the recoil that can be seen on the ultrasound screen. Finally, as always, tip position can be confirmed with hydrolocation. This is an example of jiggling versus waggling motions in an out-of-plane approach. Jiggling is helpful, especially when you're bouncing up and down on a fascial layer prior to piercing. But waggling is also helpful because if you happen to have pierced a fascia or other structure, you will see it move side to side as you waggle the needle, which should then prompt you to slide your probe a little bit further away to bring the actual needle tip into view. You will see all these principles at work here in an out-of-plane approach to a sciatic nerve block catheter. I'm using a combination of waggling and jiggling movements of the needle with gentle probing motions 
as I gradually advance my needle towards and into the fascial sheath surrounding the sciatic nerve. As my needle hand moves, my probe hand is also making small sliding and tilting movements to track the tip and optimize the view of both needle and nerve. Again, I'm gradually advancing, trying to sense fascial pops as I advance through each layer. Hydrolocation confirms the location of the tip and also pushes tissues aside to create safe spaces for further needle advancement. Needle entry into the perineural sheath of the sciatic nerve in this case is confirmed by fluid spread that expands and outlines the boundaries of the circular sciatic nerve. Intraneural injection is excluded by absence of nerve expansion. And note that the needle tip will become more visible once fluid has been injected to create a dark background for contrast, and the tip itself can be clearly identified with appropriate needle and probe manipulation. I'd like to finish with a few thoughts on local anesthetic injection around the nerve. A core principle for me is that every nerve or plexus has a fascial envelope that surrounds it, what some might call the paraneurum. It's worth noting that in some locations, this can be multi-layered and more complex than just a single layer. But if you identify this fascial envelope and you place your needle inside of it, this compartment will fill with local anesthetic. It will also contain and direct the spread of local anesthetic around the nerve, often without needing to reposition the needle. My aim is always to enter this compartment without touching the nerve if I can help it. The key is to approach nerves at a tangent to their surface so that the needle will slide past them as it pierces the enveloping fascia. It is helpful to make gentle probing motions with the needle to ensure that the nerve will slide or roll away before you actually push through the fascia. And this will avoid accidentally transfixing or traumatizing the nerve as you pop through. Tougher investing fascial layers, such as the superficial cervical fascia in this case, sometimes requires more force to pierce. And here, a steeper angle is helpful. If possible, it's also advisable to aim away from the nerve into a safe zone like the middle scalene muscle in this example, so that there is nothing serious at risk of damage as the needle pops through. In summary, aim to enter the potential space of the fascia envelope some distance away from the nerve to minimize the risk of transfiction. A tactile pop and visible recoil of tissue signifies the fascia has been pierced. Hydrolocation will then confirm position. If it is too deep, as in this case, spread in the surrounding tissue will be seen. A useful trick is to ask your assistant to inject slowly and continuously to produce a trickle of local anesthetic. Withdraw the needle as they're injecting and the tip pops back into the potential space of the fascial envelope and the space will suddenly open up. This is much better than an intermittent withdrawal and injection technique. Note that it's not essential to always obtain a circumferential spread of local anesthetic around the nerve. And this is because local anesthetic does not spread in just one plane of imaging. As I've mentioned, the paraneural envelope will contain and direct the spread of local anesthetic along the nerve. So while injecting, always slide the probe back and forth along the course of the nerves to see how it is spreading at other locations. This will help decide if the needle has to be repositioned or not. This is illustrated in the video of a popliteal sciatic nerve block. We are injecting at the bifurcation, and by scanning proximally and distally during the process of injection, we can see that spread is actually occurring around both tibial and common perineal branches. And also, more importantly, that the nerves are not expanding, which would signal an intraneural injection. Once again, this signifies the importance of doing some dynamic scanning while injecting. There is no need to continuously visualize the needle if you're not actually moving it. If you do have to move your needle around to different positions, for example, to target different nerves in the auxiliary plexus block, for example, it can be helpful to instruct your assistant to slowly inject a given volume, for example, three to five mils, and to advance and move the needle around at the same time that they're injecting. The jet of local anesthetic coming out of the needle tip pushes away nerves and dissects fascial planes, 
creating safe spaces for the needle tip to advance into. The only downside of this maneuver is that it can result in higher total injected local anesthetic volumes. The final tip I'll leave you with is the reverse bevel trick. Local anesthetic emerges from the needle orifice as a jet and the direction of spread is influenced by the direction that the bevel is facing. This is why when we have the bevel facing up, we usually aim to place our needle at the five or seven o'clock aspect of a nerve so that the local anesthetic will travel towards the nerve and around it. If, however, your approach takes the needle over the nerve so that you're now on the 10 or two o'clock aspect of the nerve, then it helps to spin the needle hub 180 degrees so that the bevel faces downwards. The double echo of the needle tip will not be seen in this case. But now the direction of the bevel will direct local anesthetic spread down and towards the nerve rather than away from it, as in this example of a radial nerve in an axillary brachial plexus block, in which we have approached the radial, the radial nerve from above the artery rather than under the artery. Note how with the bevel facing downwards, we can get efficient local anesthetic spread that travels back and down towards the radial nerve that lies under the needle. Thanks very much for watching. Please feel free to check out my earlier videos, which cover some of these points and others in more detail.